Welcome. I'm Harmony Slater, your host of the Finding Harmony podcast. Over the past 20 years, I've taught thousands of yoga teachers and students to explore the intersection between ancient wisdom and modern everyday life, using mind-body practices to heal, awaken, and manifest their dreams from the inside out. This podcast is a sanctuary for those feeling overwhelmed by life's challenges. Are you ready to jump in and discover how these challenges aren't actually in the way, but are the way to finding harmony? Let's invite the magic back in. Hi, welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. Guess what? It's Russell's birthday coming up this week on April 22nd, so send him some birthday love. That would be great. Today we have a very special guest who is one of his old friends that he grew up with back in the good old days in Louisiana. His name is Sumanth Gopinath. And you might be wondering why we're interviewing one of Russell's old friends. Not just because it's his birthday coming up, but Sumanth is an incredibly interesting human. He's a professor of music and also a musician who plays grassroots folk music from America. And so we are talking today about the exchange between India and North America, similarities, differences in Indian music versus folk music, and how both of his parents were born in India and how they came to America and how he grew up in the USA and some of his experiences growing up. So it's a deep dive into culture and cultural exchange. So if you're a lover of nuance and learning and culture, this is going to be a conversation that you will absolutely love. Sumanth and his music are really fun, really beautiful, and I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. It's a full class and composition on music history, as well as the history of India, and how it all ties back and relates to folk music in North America, and even Russell's own experience of growing up in Louisiana and also being a Westerner who's very much interested in India and Indian culture, adopting many practices from India and learning in India for many, many years. So um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. So let's jump in and get... All right. All right. Welcome to the Finding Harmony podcast. Thank you for having me. Harmony. Hi. How are you doing, Samad? (laughs) Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. It's so such a pleasure. This is this is surreal to be sure. I I have an introduction um, that I'd like to read for our listeners. Um, We have a a large uh, Swedish population that listens to the show, and they may not know your work. So I'm just gonna okay, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Our esteemed guest, Samanth Gopinath, is associate professor of music theory. He is the author of The Ringtone Dialectic, Economy and Cultural Form. He co-edited co-edited with Jason Stanyak. Stanyak? Stanyak. Stanyak, the Oxford Handbook of Mobile Music Studies and Rethinking Reich with, I cannot pronounce that name. That is Welsh. This is a Welsh name. Yeah. <laughs> Quick up, Sean. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a tough one. His writings on Steve Reich, musical minimalism, Marxism, and music scholarship, the Nike Plus Sport Kit, the Ringtone Industry, Bob Dylan, and Benjamin Britten have appeared in various scholarly journals and edited collections. He is working on a book project on musical minimalism and is conducting research on sound and new and formerly new media, Bob Dylan's musicianship, the aesthetics of smoothness, <laughs> and the music of the Scottish, oh, there's where it was written, the Scottish composer James Dylan. He is the leader of the independent Americana band, The Gated Community, and you and I went to high school together. That's right. And we <laughs> go back a long way. <laughs> I mean, Dude. over... 
30 years, right? It's now, now going on yeah. uh, 32, because we met when we were 14. Yeah. We met Mor- in Mrs. Moore's uh, AP English class. When we were That's 14, right. maybe 15. I mean, 30, we're talking 34 years, right? 34 years. <laughs> 30, yeah. 30 to 34 years, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, in, in, my inter- in my introduction, I wrote something that um, I feel personally very privileged to have had your friendship. I was something um, less civilized than feral at that time. <laughs> and uh, I feel like you were very patient uh, with me, uh, extraordinarily patient. And I just want to say how much I appreciate the, the kindness. <laughs> and I'm, I mean that because I was not a pleasant person. And I just, <laughs> thank you. Really? Was he well, not no, pleasant? <laughs> well, this, you know, this is a, this is a long thing and it's hard. It's, it's complicated to talk about, but I mean, Russ and I have been, you know, dear friends for a long time. And so I think at, in those years, it was really a product of moving to Louisiana from the Chicago area and really not having like a network and fitting in to that, that kind of world that I sort of was inserted into. And there was a lot of bullying, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of people in those classes I was in, I mean, Russ participated in it was, Mm -hmm. was part of that experience. And so, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time like thinking about that stuff and going Mm -hmm. through various phases with it. Um, You know, originally, you know, I was just like hurt and upset. And then when I went away to this school uh, that, was a boarding school, like a boarding magnet school, but a public school. So it was very affordable. It was like $500 a year or something mm-hmm. um, uh, called the, the Louisiana, Louisiana School for Maths, Science and Arts. And Raz actually came with me to my graduation. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, what happened was that that school really transformed my sense of self. And I mm-hmm. felt much more kind of accepting of the fact that, you know, I was a smart kid. I was a musician. Um, I think sort of consciousness of my racial identity came later, but it was more implicitly there in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. And so when I came back and visited, I just felt very differently about a lot of it. Um, And I I think it was really that last summer, that, that, that summer and maybe spring of my senior year that I got in touch with Russ again. And I can't remember exactly the context, but I then do. we, oh, you do. Okay. Maybe then you, you, know, you came to a, um, like a musical performance or some kind of a, a event at Slido high. And you came in and you were rocking this like shaggy, uh, shaggy black hair and a beard. And I remember we made eye contact and something lit up like this kind of this, the sense of namaskara where you hmm. the the like something we saw something in each other and we both lit up at the same time and initiated a friendship and i remember the moment e- exactly because it, hmm. it had been difficult before that yeah yeah um and that's good. See, my memory is terrible. So I tend to remember like certain moments and flashes and images and feelings, but, but precise memories are ne- have never been great for me. And so it's nice to hear that. And I remember, I, but I, then I do remember that we, you know, we hung out a lot. Well, you came to the graduation. I think we spent mm-hmm. a lot of time listening to fish. That was part of the whole <laughs> getting to be friends. And the, then their whole yeah. bluegrass second set was right, a thing. That right. Was, yes. Excited about. Yeah. Yeah. And they're covering the white album and all yeah. these things that we did. Yeah. And then Russ mentioned that recording we made. So we, uh, my brother and I had been making these various kinds of, you know, song recordings at our house and Russ joined us with one of them, the one called tree monkey. I have uh, that is, yeah. here actually, if you, yeah. if you can hear this. <laughs> K 
can you it's hear it? Trans- no, it's not coming across. So. It's not coming I across. Know, I know the I know the thing. Maybe you'll have to layer it in later. Yeah, we'll have to layer it in later. But um, it is ridiculous. It sounds it's ri- good. It's a ridiculous song, and I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. I'm going to uh, turn that down for a moment. Turn it off. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. turn it off as well. Then. Yeah. yeah um, you can layer it in. Yeah. <laughs> I do have it. I don't, I have it as an MP. I thought yeah. I must have sent it to you. Yeah. That's a, yeah, you did. Yeah. yeah. And I'll, we have an editor who's going to layer these things in for oh, us. Oh, cool. Perfect. But I just really? thought I could, I could yeah. play it for a bit as a, as a touchstone. Um, that was really, that was the only time in my life I've ever tried to be a musician. And, um, <laughs> It was not, it was, it was wild, but what I think, because I'm not good at that, but one, but one thing I what that was happening was just how much learning I was, I was receiving from you guys, like learning about Rachmaninoff or Counterpoint or listening to the way that you listen to music. You know, mm-hmm. we'd listen to the White Album, we'd listen to Jimi Hendrix together mm-hmm. and like, like the little subtleties that Shimin you know, your brother would, would mention about music, like, do, do you hear what he's doing there? It created the capacity for learning about mm-hmm. music that I hadn't had to that point. And there was another event that, that happened that, that also became a kind of um, um, a touchstone for, for leaping off. Um, I was watching in your house, I was watching the Bulls play the Knicks in like a playoff game. And I was a passionate Bulls follower and I got really upset and I took something and I threw it against the wall, if you remember. I and, remember that. And <laughs> you, and I was, and afterward I calmed down and I, 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 and I think even like the next day I apologized to you about throwing things in your parents' house. And you said, no, no, it's it's okay. This is the kind of thing that I think that you would probably do in your own home. Hmm. And I had so much tolerance <laughs> and compassion and patience. And it was it was almost something you could describe as anti-cultural to my experience as an American, to be hmm. that that generous and understanding of the other. Hmm. And I had, and I, and I feel like that that kind of thought style was something that um, was was so foundational to Harmony and I and our understanding and our study of of yoga and yoga practice and the Yoga Sutras. Mm. Um, mm. Patanjali was just to trying to see the self in the other as as something unified rather than separate, mm. and. But I, when I think back on, when I was thinking back on our relationship and I was thinking back on, on that particular moment, I was like, oh, that's the first time I ever encountered that. Hmm. Hmm. So there's, yeah, there's so much here to kind of unpack. <laughs> it's really interesting. So first of all, I mean, both of you know much more in many ways about, you know, facets of Indian culture than I know or will ever know, right? I mean, my experiences in relationship to it are complicated, but, and partial because I grew up in the US and most of my work and thinking are not oriented around India, you know? And so, so that's fascinating to me. I mean, when I think of self and other, I think of also aspects of Western philosophy and Levinas's work in particular was someone really preoccupied with the other and, Mm -hmm. and the trying to kind of reconcile the relationship of the self to other. I mean, there's a long history in Western philosophy of thinking about those things in various mm-hmm. ways. And the Hegelian lineage or tradition is one that I come out of, uh, from because it flows into Marx and that's, you know, I'm a Marxist. And so those mm-hmm. things like end up being kind of important to the way I think about a lot of things, but, um, but yeah, but obviously they, you know, they, they appear in different places, right. And, yeah. and in different, you know, variants or flavors or what have you, but I mean that you know there there are lots of there are lots of ways that some of these ideas, which I think is really interesting. I was thinking about that moment and trying to reconstruct it in my mind. Was it we were watching the TV? We must have been in the in the living room, and mm-hmm. I think did you throw something at the brick wall with the fireplace? Possibly, that, yeah. And mm-hmm. I mean, and I think about it too. It, it, that moment, I'm sure it would have depended on like what it was that you threw and when <laughs> you threw, you know where you threw it, right? Like. And yeah. 
you know, had you thrown something that shattered and broke, I probably would have been more upset. So, <laughs> right? so, yeah. so these things are all, you know, like, but, you know, you were also a new friend and I was also trying, I mean, you know, in general, I'm a pretty accepting, tolerant mm-hmm. person, but, um, you know, it's these, so many of these things are so like context dependent and, you know, specific as to how they unfold. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but, but, um, but that's, that's not to say though, that, aspects of you know hindu philosophy and culture and thinking you know they were kind of all around me in various ways because of my parents Mm -hmm. um and then in a different way because of these comic books that i know that we showed you they're called amar chitrakata and they were Mm -hmm. um there's this kind of post-independence project that ended up kind of being an interest in uh among both, you know, sort of diasporic Indians as well as Indians in India, um, reading about, you know, you know, in a kind of the loosely Mahabharata. Hindu-centric, the Mahabharata and the, yeah. and the Ramayana are both like represented in it. We had those. We had mm. a bunch of them. I, I purchased my own there. copies, actually. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think yeah. they're kind of amazing, but they're also, yeah. you know, like the Indian leftists are critical, which, you know, they they should be or whatever. But like, you know, it's one of these things to think about that um, the, um, you know, these post-independence projects that balanced, you know, the politics of having a Hindu majority with a kind of ecumenical, you know, discourse and imaginary, which, you know, which historically is kind of baked into or part of Hinduism, which isn't a single thing. I mean, what is it? Mm-hmm. It's like, it's a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah. And then and was written into the Indian, the post-independence constitution. Uh, and so that's the India that I sort of believe in and like. And the current India is the India of, you know, Hindutva and like, you know, basically fascism, you know, and yeah. which we, ha- we have our own version of here, right? And so, so you know, there's there's a lot. I mean, I'm you're in Canada, right? I'm in the U.S. and the U.S. is here. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> Many parts uh, of Canada would love to be in, in the United States. Right. And no, I, I, yeah, Central in Canada. This fascist yeah. theocracy. Yes. They would love yeah, that. Yeah. 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 The, mm. the trucker, I remember the trucker uh, moment, yeah. which was a special Canadian moment. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I mean, I, it feels like we're right now like sleepwalking into authoritarianism, you know, because yeah. you know, people are frustrated with Joe Biden, Democrats, and, and, you know, inflation, whatever, you know, these things are or all it's, frustrating. Or it's or whatever, manufactured but... dissent. Right. I mean, yeah, mm. depending on how you read it. Right. Mm. And, um, and so, so anyway, these, these kinds of, these kinds of, you know, sort of questions around my background are like filtered through and meet now, like my later political awareness that developed, yeah. you know, in graduate mm. school and um, becoming involved in labor activism and, yeah. And, you know, which I still have a hand in today. And so, so yeah, so these, anyway, all of which is to say that, you know, anyway, uh, to see something of, you know, Hindu philosophy in my childhood is, is super fascinating because I think it's, it's there. And at the same time, it's, it's also, you know, there are other things there too. Right. So yeah. The, the, word that, the word that would come up for me was it would be something like samskara, which is the inherited patterns of uh, belief and action. And um, what I inherited was a cycle of uh, violence and alcoholism. <laughs> and, you know, like, it almost, you know, like maybe some Lutheran tenets in there somewhere, but like not, mm. not really lived, you know? And so, <laughs> and so I'm, you know, so my, my pattern of behavior is, is entering um, this kind of, you know, wonderful world that I was, I was invited into with your father, who was, you know, um, a nice man, which I'm not sure I'd ever met before. And <laughs> right, yeah. he was like a nice upstanding man, very interested in our health and in your health and, yeah, and, yeah. uh, and our development and your mother, who was, you know, my algebra teacher, who was also teaching me how to cook like a kind of family that I, that was so far removed from my experiences as to be on another planet. And so wow. I'm, I'm now, I'm so now I'm kind of bathing in, in your, in your family's pattern and behavior. And it's, it is, it is fundamentally different for me, but that became that's awesome. fascinating. Yeah. And then I, I went to Chicago and I didn't realize that you were from Chicago. That you were, were you born there? Yeah. I was born in Chicago yeah. Heights. Yeah. 
And we <laughs> were in the Homewood Flossmoor area for nine years before we moved to Slidell. Slidell. Yeah, yeah I went we to go. There. Yeah. So I went and saw recently, this would have been summer of last year. We were, I think we did a drive from Minneapolis down to Slidell to see my parents. And mm -hmm. I think the first two summers uh, after the pandemic, we did that. And so, or the first two, I guess well, we're still in it, I guess, but it's mm -hmm. anyway, whatever, <laughs> how you want to talk about it is complicated. But, um, but we drove down and on the way back, we decided to stop by the, the house. And that was the house that my father, um, he general contracted and built. And so oh, um, it's in a neighborhood called, um, Elysian Fields. Yeah, I know. Pastoral, yeah. Uh, but there's uh, also an Elysian Fields in New Orleans. That's funny. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Am I misremembering it? Hold on. Arcadia was the school. Ian Burke wrote. I think it was called Elysian Fields. Yeah, anyway. Well, um, okay. Anyway, it's uh, I, maybe I, I could totally be misremembering it. But <laughs> anyway, what I remember is that's where it was. It was in that Homewood Flossmore area. Um, and what I was struck by was that the neighborhood was now largely an upper middle class African American neighborhood, whereas before yeah. it was racially whiter. Yeah. Um, and so, but it was interesting because it was, you know, I don't know if the combination of race and class and the, the geography and the patterns there um, had anything to do with it, but it is not it looks basically like it did when I was there growing up. So there were a few differences. My dad built the house very near to the train station because he wanted to take the train into work as a commuter. He was, his, his dad was a chief railway engineer in India and, and both during the colo late colonial and then independence era. And so trains wow. were part of his life. He has this whole like transit thing. I mean, he did wow. Grew up with the trains thing. He was on ships in the British Merchant Navy in the 1960s. And then he he went to work at Pullman, where he was helping like a project manager, manager I think, um, helping to design these trail mobile train cars. And then when they went out of business, he had another job. And then when you moved to Louisiana, he took the job that a lot of people in Subtle had, which was working at the uh, Martin Marietta plant building the external right. tank of the space shuttle, right? There were yeah. a lot of NASA people. And, yeah, there were. Yeah. And St. Tammany, especially. Exactly. It, it, and is, that must be when he started picking up all of these um, railroad songs in country and Western, <laughs> the country Western experience is the railroad, isn't it? I mean, that's part, maybe. I mean, I will say this, which is that that PR bit is a little exaggerated. <laughs> our, our press person, our press person wrote that up to say that I was influenced by my dad's classic country. Really? Fashion. I mean, that's, oh. I mean, I, it's not, it's not in, untrue, but I would say it would be country folk. So okay. we did listen, you know, there were certain country songs that he loved, like he loved Hank Williams's Jambalaya. And we listened to that a lot. He loved okay. Tennessee Ernie Ford's um, 16 Tons. We listened to that yeah. a lot. He loved the, and then he loved like more folk revival-y stuff. Tom Dooley, you know, the Kingston yeah. Trio, the Brothers yeah, yeah. Four, that kind of stuff. So I would say it was country music. Yeah, yes. <laughs> right, the folk revival people. Um, yeah, and so he was that kind of, I would say country was part of this picture of, you know, Western music that I think was or sort of Western, you know, vernacular popular music that he was interested in. And we did, we did listen to those things, but it wasn't a, like a collection, you know. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But, it, but, that, but in retrospect, that was an interesting influence, you know, to go back and reflect on. Yeah. It, it's interesting to have like, I mean, to come over from India and then to have Indian music, which is very, very different yeah, and like slightly, slightly. <laughs> using like semitones <laughs> and I don't know, quarter oh. tones and one eighth tones and all the different right, tones yes. <laughs> yes. and, and like different scales than we even have in Western music. But then for him to so like kind of, find an a adoration or a connection a, like a soul connection with well maybe country he, western music maybe he's also a big fan of Derek trucks i don't i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't think so but then like for you too yeah. to kind of like be 
like you said, growing up in the West and in a very Western way, but there's all these subtle kind of still subtle cultural influences because yeah. it's just the water you swim in. <laughs> yeah, completely. Right. Yeah. I mean, the way I talk is influenced by being a South Asian American. I mean, I often think about my accent as something that is influenced by my own singing and in, in country Western style music. And, you know, I, I definitely have speech patterns that are that are characteristic of South Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, yeah, I, I don't have a typical, like, you know, St. Tammany Parish, Louisiana accent, because <laughs> I was, you know, I moved there when I was nine. And Shamin, my brother and I, we, we made this pact with each other that we were not going to talk like that. You know, that was a thing we said. We explicitly said when I was nine and he was seven. Um, but, you know, I think it creeps in at the edges, yeah. you know, in yeah. various ways. Um, you know, but yeah. And I would say in terms of music, yes. I mean, very much and culturally, I was, you know, many aspects of my growing my upbringing were very Indian. I mean, I, we had these monthly pujas that we would go to and do. We had, sometimes they were at our house. Um, mm -hmm. We did, um, in fact, that fireplace was the kind of makeshift altar and people would kind of yeah. gather around that yeah. and set up this like gun, but the, you know, this stuff. And that so. Is, it's just so, so yeah, bizarre it, that I ended it up is being as a pujari. <laughs> yeah, and it's totally led, weird. and led, yeah. <laughs> and led puja and yeah. you know i had my own kind of veda vyasa that i would i would do puja to and i would you know wake up in the morning and keep and 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 light it's just it's it's an interesting arc that the two of us have because i thought you were going to become a a classical pianist right and you went to yale to, to study music uh, as i understand and and you know i know that you'd studied electrical or uh chemical engineering at yeah, it was electrical my brother did electrical chemical. engineering yeah. oh right yeah at yeah. university of texas um there's all these beautiful like triple helixes through our life where we keep intersecting and we keep as yeah. harmony might say there's a karmic connection that we can't <laughs> unwind and we're stuck with each other, we're stuck yeah. with each other. and <laughs> i would have thought you would have gone off to to study you know um and yet you do study uh and write about classical uh composition mm -hmm. um but you are a bluegrass musician of americana music and i'm a you know now a retired yoga teacher <laughs> And it's, <laughs> slash retired Pujari. <laughs> I'm retired yeah, right, Pujari. Right. I still yeah. have this stuff. I can get it out. Yeah. Me. Well, I do. I want to hear more about the retirement, but uh, but I <laughs> but I have to say because but to step back, yeah, it is funny. I mean that that Dan Aykroyd Eddie Murphy movie Trading Places comes to yes, mind many it times. Does. Um, but um, but I will say that yeah, I mean I in terms of my trajectory, it was still very shaped by some of the concerns that immigrant families and South Asian American upwardly mobile, uh, you know, middle-class families have. And, and that, that to step back from what I'm about to say also shapes our interactions, right? Like as, a, as kids, which is that one, uh, on the one hand, we were a non-white family and your family was white, but on the other hand, you know, we were, a, you know, economically, class relatively more stable than your household. And mm -hmm. so I think class plays a big role in like the way that, you know, we interacted and, you know, especially then when you came to kind of, you know, be participating in our household, hanging out and stuff like it was part of what you saw was also the kind of, you know, the inheritances of relative class privilege. Um, yeah. You saw relative also just, cultural privilege i mean my family is not a wealthy family and in, in illinois actually even though we were never you know poor my father struggled a lot because he was sort of meeting this um wave of u.s deindustrialization that was central to right. what was happening in a lot of you know yeah. sort of manufacturing yeah. industries at that time and so he kept being un you know losing his job being laid off because of yeah. you know major yeah. economic shifts and so so we were things were kind of like dodgy economically when we were in Illinois um, and when he made it to Louisiana 
economically things really firmed up and there was a whole process of basically like getting themselves out of debt and like getting to a kind of economic stability that they'd never had. And I would say the trade-off, here's another interesting trade-off is that socio-culturally Illinois was very peaceful for me. I mean, I had, and you know, this is often the case as you're younger and you enter adolescence and all the hormones and all the shit of that, you know, age, yeah. you know, sort of those years of growing up, you know, kind of come to that, come to a head. Um, those weren't there, but I would say I, I had no sense of like discrimination or anything. Like I just did not, it felt, you know, like placid and peaceful. Yeah. And there were, there were other kids of various ethnic backgrounds in my, um, in my schools and, so it was when I got to Louisiana that then people started asking me these questions about like, who are you? Where are you from? You know, they had trouble pronouncing my name. I mean, and they, I'm sure they did in Illinois and I just don't remember. But um, there was, you know, attempts like early on to try to convert me or like threaten me saying, you know, I'm going to hell because I'm not mm -hmm. a Christian. Jesus Christ is not my Lord and Savior. Like that stuff was there. And then like the kind of middle school through early high school sort of bullying stuff, which had like, that's, you know, just that alone, like it's just, there are so many layers to that experience. And then Louisiana school, which was a whole different Louisiana and a kind of its own sort of utopian one, which was really <laughs> powerful, it, like I was mentioning. And then Texas, right? I was in Texas for five years. So I had this whole like sort of sojourn in the South and I still think of myself as a Southerner, but, um, but that kind of, yeah, that kind of class experience sort of shaped um, a lot and it's whatever class, racial, regional experience shaped and me a lot. And because of that sort of cultural privilege that you encountered, you know, my parents, even though they're not wealthy, as I was trying to unfold back, they were very, very culturally privileged. I mean, they are, they're a Brahmin caste, Maharashtrian Brahmins. They are, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my father's father was a chief engineer in the railway, these railway colonies in the South of India. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, he was like living like royalty. And then my mom's father was the, like a founder of one of the Indian institutes of technology and a wow. president of multiple ones, you know? So, I mean, these were like very powerful people mm -hmm. and my parents were sort of not powerful not as high accomplishing people from these powerful families. And so, which is also interesting. But that often so, happens, right? When, when families yeah. have to change countries or choose to change countries, you often lose a lot of, you know, um, inherited wealth. Yeah. Inherited wealth or, or status as far as yes. economic status, because you have to kind of start over literally. Yeah. In a new yeah. Country. That's, <laughs> That's totally right. And I, and so so what they had was a kind of set of expectations, yeah. you know, sort of cultural practices, behaviors, beliefs, you know, yeah. knowledge that then met this new, you know, sort of relative lack of privilege, you know, born of immigrant experience. And so anyway, all of those things shaped what I did when I went to school, which was to be a good Indian boy and study engineering, even though I was not very good at fixing or doing anything like that. <laughs> um, and I, I, and I did fine. I aced the degree, but I didn't really learn a whole lot. I mean, I learned some things and I feel like I still think about it in certain ways. I use engineering more doing music than anything else. And then when I went to, to study music, it was still with the practical bent. And this is to, to get back now several layers back to Russ's question, which is that there was, you know, what was I doing? I, a part of me definitely wanted to be a classical pianist and I was studying and playing very seriously at that time, mm -hmm. but I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. Like I had, I would say if I had been trained better, I would have had and had better technique and better teachers who focused on the physiological facets of pedagogy. Maybe I would have had a shot. I don't know. I may, I don't know. I'm not convinced my body could have done it. Or if I had to, I would have had to really thought differently about how to use my body. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Texas, I actually got tendonitis in my left arm. And so I had to kind of play or right arm. And so I had to play left hand pieces for about a year, um, mm -hmm. which was interesting. And then, you know, I built back up and I, I just never practiced at the depth or scale that I did before then. And I was practicing wrongly, you know, I mean, this is also probably entirely germane to the kinds of things you've done as yoga teachers, but right. But mm -hmm. like, so, so that is 
ex I was exactly yeah. what we were thinking, yeah. and I'm sure yeah. we were yeah. Both yeah. chomping at the and, bit to talk about it. <laughs> so, yeah, so be curious to hear about that. But then, but then that whole so that experience quickly made me realize, you know, I mean, I have some talent, and I still do play classical piano, but I realized that there were going to be limitations based on you know the trajectory I'd taken, and so given that what could I do? And I wanted to do music and the sort of paths that were available for someone like me would have been composition or academic music study. And the way that I experienced or encountered composition and academic music study at Texas really shaped that because it was the people who were teaching music theory who were really inspiring to me and the composers were less so. There was one I, I encountered later, Russell Pinkston, who taught electroacoustic music, and I really liked him. But um, but I also had friends who were composers. In fact, one of my uh, you know college dorm mates and still very long long standing friend, Trevor Bacha, who actually was was in um, Austin doing. He graduated from the the honors liberal arts program that that Gabrielle, my ex wife, uh, went into, and also so went she, to high school with us. She also went to, to high school, and I, yeah. And, oh, I also and we're, <laughs> yeah, he did. And um, and <laughs> this is a painting of hers. Actually, went from from is the it years, really? Yeah, oh. the, yeah. She did these amazing paints. She's still so we're still. She went to Yale for painting, right? She went to RISD for painting. Oh, RISD, and, right, right, right. And then went to Yale for a PhD in art history. And now okay. she and her husband teach uh in humboldt county in northern way northern california really and so, wow. yeah and so wow. her husband is an artist and teaches at humboldt state and she teaches at uh college of the red woods or something i don't know anyway by so county decree you have to also have a marijuana farm I think that's <laughs> right. she's talked a lot about that that <laughs> facet of that world really, yeah, really interesting anyway so so she um so this program, which my friend Trevor went into, he was a composer and he's he's a wonderful composer and friend. Anyway, and I hadn't seen him in years and I saw him for the first time in person, like in the fall of tw last year, which was also mm -hmm. really wonderful. But he um, he now teaches at Yale. So his his husband mm -hmm. is in the sociology department. He's on, the, on like an adjunct faculty in the Department of Music where I got my doctorate. Anyway. Mm -hmm. That, His, that painting sorry. is the road to Humboldt, by the way. That one. <laughs> oh <talking> wow! <laughs> That's just by by random. Wow! Amazing. <clears throat> amazing. Wow! Yeah, more trading places, more double helix, triple yeah. helix. Whatever. <laughs> um, but um, but anyway, and so he ended up um, because of his experience. I think I was do I was skeptical of what it would mean to compose. Mm -hmm. And then here's the other key piece of this was that I was finding out about job placement. You know, by the end of my degree. Everyone, you know, my brother, Gabrielle, my um, other best friend from college, Rohit Prasan Kumar. I remember. So, that. Yeah, you he remember. Over my yeah. place is drummer, as I remember. Yes, that's right. Yes, he did. And, and so, <laughs> he was and much a, better, I imagine. He is a good drummer. But yeah, anyway, so Rohit is actually now, uh, he worked at Los Alamos for many years. He went to uh, MIT to do a PhD in engineering optics. And then now he works in some kind of startup company in Seattle, but he still lives in Albuquerque. And so he sort of telecommutes and works there. But um, yeah, he's also still close friends and stuff. And it's, it's always great to talk to him. So anyway, all of the ever them, all of them were saying, you should go into music. This is what you want to do. And so I started researching job placement rates and music theory actually had high placement rates. And I've only more recently kind of really clearly figured out why which was essentially that music theorists, the creation of the professional music theorist, which is you know what my job is, um, was predicated essentially on professionalizing aspects of the music curriculum theory teaching, which had traditionally been done by other people because there was no professional music theorist. There were mm -hmm. music theory pedagogues, pe people sort of specialized in this kind of teaching. There were um, composers, many composers ended up doing this kind of work. And then there were historical musicologists and other performers would do it. And this creation of this new profession, which sort of created this much more research driven sort of approach to the field, ended up being part of a kind of post World War II movement that really took off in the 50s and 60s. And the formation of the Society for Music Theory was formed in 1978. And so one of the people I had encountered there at Texas was Patrick McCrellis. He was the person, actually, he taught this summer class on. 20th century music theory that 
I was sitting in on for fun and Rohit, I dragged Rohit with it, <laughs> with, with, with me to the course. And I just found it really easy. And like, I knew the repertoire because I listened to a lot of classical music at that point. And so, and Pat was just encouraging. And so I thought, well, this is cool. I'll keep doing this music theory thing. And that's kind of how I got into it. And by the time when I was thinking, what am I going to do? I saw these placement rates and I thought, this is, this is a viable path for me. But it really was predicated again on this kind of creation of this profession and essentially stealing jobs from other people, most of whom would have been composers. And so I published an article on this like, earlier this year, um, said, like what the political economy of our field is. Um, yeah. So anyway, it's really interesting. Well, it is fascinating. I'm so, I, so that's how I, that's, that's a big part of how I ended up where I am. Before, I want to interrupt Harmony. I want to let her I'll let her speak. She has something she's passionate about. I just want to say this this painting also behind me is oh, is my is Leonard Anderson, my painting teacher in, in New York. Oh. I painted a, a shelf of his. I took a photo, a sneaky photo, I took a shelf. Oh, his cool. son was replaced by Mike D in the Beastie Boys, and he's also still bitter about it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see the little the little doll and I like yeah, yeah, that's... Belmer and other thing and like surrealists like kind of were popping in my head, but yeah, he right, yeah. he was a he was a big his big focus was his little doll. He that's most of his work was painting that. But I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> well, just I was just thinking, like for those listening, um what is, I mean, we all kind of know what a composer is, someone who writes music. We know what a musician is, someone who plays music. I think we can kind of figure out what a music historian is, someone who looks at the history of music. But what does a yoga theorist do? Music theorist. A music theorist. Yeah, I said yoga theorist. <laughs> yeah, I like it. What does a um, music theorist do? So maybe we can become yoga theorists. <laughs> Well, they're, they're probably related, but I would say this is a thing that's worth unpacking and I'll try to do it efficiently. Essentially, <laughs> yeah. the way music theorists define what they do mm -hmm. is that they're the people who teach the structure of music, how music works. And so okay. when you take a class from a music theorist, you're not necessarily focusing on the historical context of what a composer or creator does of how, but you're really thinking about how do they do what they do and that these mm -hmm. kinds of patterns of doing have maybe broader historical trajectories that you're, and practices and traditions you're participating in. Uh, Russell mentioned earlier counterpoint that would, that's the art of writing lines against other lines. So you have a melodic line that may be in an upper register, and then you have to write a melodic line that goes with it at the lower register. And so you would teach students how to do this. There would be like mm -hmm. practices and rules based on the traditions of teaching this kind of thing that go back to, you know, really like the 15th century, I think. Um, and so this kind of history of, you know, sort of, teaching these traditions and practices of how to make music. Mm -hmm. And really we're talking about Western classical music. I mean, that's what it was originally. That's, that's typically what music theorists do. So when you take a class with a music theorist historically, um, you would take classes in harmony. Mm -hmm. You learn about chords and about how they work and sequence the kind of grammar and organizing of them. And you would have very limited sort of sets of exercises you would do to try to kind of compose and write out those chords according to sort of rules like in exercises. And so there's a kind of like math problem like element to it, but it's also an aesthetic thing because you want it to sound good and there are certain criteria right. for what sounds good. And so that that's like you build up this kind of skill set, you know, over, you know, several semesters and then you start studying advanced techniques like counterpoint would be a more advanced thing, studying, you know, an analytical methods for music that that doesn't use traditional chords and in fact uses different kinds of sort of basis for the music well, what we call post tonal theory we're not going to get into the term but that that would be another kind of more advanced thing and then specialist you know courses based on more research driven things and some of music theory gets very very mathematical um, mm -hmm. because there are people using various kinds of mathematics to understand sort of fundamental properties of music given certain assumptions um, some music theory focuses on, you know, music psychology and cognition. So they'll do lab studies and try to kind of, you know, some to pet, can, pet scan studies, more abstract, you know, sort of 
research based on psychology. That's a whole other music cognition is another area. There are people who do do the history of music theory because this practice has a long history. And so <laughs> they study that and we're required to learn that in grad school. Um, and then there are other areas of focus, whether you're focusing on, you know, sort of music in this sort of general chord based era and techniques used to analyze it, music that sort of passed that, and then other techniques or other questions like there are studies on rhythm, like how do music theorists talk about rhythm and meter or how do music theorists talk about timbre, you know, how music sounds, like how sounds sound. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these sorts of different kinds of ways into questions around music have opened up a, a field over the last, you know, a couple of maybe three decades. And so that so music theory started out as a very sort of traditional oriented thing. It became research driven much more in like a, in the mid 20th century. And then through that research driven process, whole avenues of exploration really opened up. And so and so there's this kind of divide between what a music theorist research is, which is often technical or very specific, and then something that would be often very basic, you know, like I'm teaching people to read music or, you know, spell chords right. or write key signatures. So that's like the kind of traditional, that might, let's not say traditional, but that's like the, the recent history of how music theory has tended to go. However, um, because of many developments in the field, including and and society, including George Floyd's murder, made a, a huge impact on the field as it did in so many facets of you know, North America, especially there in Minneapolis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, um, that, that has really pushed the field to become much more critical of the fact that we've basically been, you know, promoting and advocating for whether implicitly or explicitly just Western classical music. And so, and white composers and male composers. And yeah. so, yeah. And so that century European composers is what we call yes. classical music. <laughs> yeah, 17th through, mm. through and mainly 18th and 19th century. And yeah. so and so those are those those were the kind of like sort of preferred things to study and now the field has really shifted a lot so a lot of people are writing about popular music and teaching it and uh they're writing about music of the black diaspora much more jazz studies has become much more central to the field so this is this is all and you know there were people doing some of these things you know decades ago too but they were much more in the minority now these are much more the kind of majority conversations and so because so it's interesting and you know because i have my hand in lots of things like i'm and I'm also one of the few non-white music theorists. That's another thing. It's a very male, very white field. And so, which is one of the anxieties of the field is to try to diversify itself. And that has been one of the motivations as to like, how do we do that? Well, in part, we need to embrace lots of different kinds of musics. If we're music theorists, we're really should be theorists of any kind of music in principle. And then we have to develop <laughs> the expertise necessarily to figure out how to talk about it. And I would say my own take on this whole thing is that I've long been kind of dubious of music theory. That music theory, um, there are some facets of it that really are very specialized, like especially the kind of math and cognition stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, in which I, there, there absolutely should be a place for it. I mean, I'm not opposed to the existence of the field or anything, but in other parts of the world, especially in, in Europe and, uh, you know, Asia, Latin America, places where there are, you know, sort of Western, you know, European classical music style traditions that are pretty strong. Mm -hmm. um, music theory isn't separated from historical musicology. So people who do, you know, the history of music right. also do the theory of music together. And I, and my preference is to keep them together. Like I, mm -hmm. for me, history really matters. Um, Marxists really care about history. And so for me, like my approach has always been a kind of blend of theory driven you know analysis where i'm informed by the recent methods and theory to analyze or talk about specific you know pieces of music or songs but then i'm also situating them in historical context and often making kind of political and economic arguments about it and so that's my approach has much more been a kind of cultural studies meets like the kind of blend of music fields rather than this hyper-technical sort of approach to music. Although some of my stuff is still relative to other, you know, many other, you know, so historical music colleges, it is more technical because I am interested in these technical details, but I'm, I'm more interested in them, you know, not for their own sake, but because I think when you delve into the details, 
you get a, a richer sense of how it means and how it works. And the and for me, the, this is another big thing. For me, the meaning, like how to interpret it, the way that literary critics and art historians routinely talk about meaning. I mean, it's not an issue or like a kind of um, a hang up that they have. They just right. do it. But, yeah. in, but in, in music scholarship, it's a hang up. Like people huh. have long debated these questions like, does music mean? Can we talk about its meaning? Is it really just like, you know, ineffable? And these these debates keep surfacing and huh. keep circulating and cycling. They have for centuries now. And it's strange. I mean, music is abstract in many ways. It's weird, but it's also super tangible. It's also <laughs> tied when it's tied to genres and you're accessing sounds. It's also a kind of means of appropriation to get into some yeah. of the things we were, you know, thinking it's about prior to this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, like I said, I, I knew this could happen. We could really talk for hours and hours, I'm sure. Uh, but but anyway, that that concreteness of music's meaning is, I think, one of the things that I think this conversation sometimes doesn't emphasize enough. And so so a lot of my teaching focuses on that. And I teach courses on popular music. I have a new newer course I've been teaching on country music analysis. I have a class. I te- I have taught a class on Bob Dylan. I've taught classes on um, more traditional, you know, sonata analyses. I influenced by some of my teachers. I've um, I teach a class called Music and Meaning, which really focuses specifically on this kind of question that we're talking about now. And so, you know, my approach mm-hmm. to theory has been this kind of, you know blend essentially of the historical and the more abstract because i think they work better when you think of them together mm. so does that make sense I mean, it's, yeah yeah no it's, it's great it was re- really uh, it's it's fascinating and i and i and i know it's completely off what we were going to talk about but <laughs> one thing I, I i one thing i feel like i can pull a thread out of out of there is this this um what a um say uh, I was gonna. I was gonna apologize for saying this, but I, I'm. I don't know if I need to. Um, uh, w- let's let you, you. You go to Yale and you initiate a student revolt against the uh, the uh, the authorities there, and you become. I didn't. Uh, initi- I, I didn't initiate it. But I was you, part of it. <laughs> you were yeah. a part of it. Yeah. Uh, you could say that, uh, uh, yeah, a, um, a, a far right, uh, a radio announcer might call you, might call it a radicalization of your views. And at the, the same time you become a folk musician. And I have this image in my mind of Woody Guthrie with a guitar, this machine kills fascists. And I'm, that's, that's <laughs> there's all sorts of, of wrongheaded thinking in that description, but I, I, as a, I wonder if you could jump into what happened that when you went from Texas to Yale, that all of these, you know, um, um, very um, transformative uh, things started to happen for you. Yeah, this is a great question. And it really is kind of one of the defining turning points in my life. So if one of them was going, I would say one of them was moving to Louisiana, you know, (laughs) complicated mixed feelings about it, but definitely a major turning point. Second one would have been going to that school, um, that Louisiana school, which in which Natchitoches. I, it's sort of Natchitoches, yeah, which saved my life in some ways. I feel like without that school, I don't know what I would be as a person. Mm-hmm. And then the third one would have been going to Yale and encountering these um, remarkable, you know, essentially a remarkable social movement. And I didn't know any, I was very apolitical or at least my politics were only instinctive. I mean, my parents are liberal Democrats, you know, which itself <laughs> was, you know, far to the left of the people that were around them. I would say they edge towards socialist. Um, not quite there, maybe, but pretty The close. number of people and, that we went to school with that voted for David Duke was something like 60%, 40%. Right. And my dad always talks about this. At the mm-hmm. time, he said there was this, there was this bumper sticker going around, which it said, vote for the crook. It matters because who was running against David Duke was Edwin Edwards, the right. former governor, who right. was already con- convicted of racketeering and had done jail time. I think it just, so, just got out of prison. Yeah, he just got out of prison, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so I think this this kind of thing. What you know, they were much more politically aware and savvy than I was. I really didn't think about it. And so, but when I got to Yale, what happened was that a classmate in the music department in my first semester there asked me 
so do you want to join the union? And I thought, sure, I'll join the union. <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea what that meant, but I thought, sure. You know, I mean, I had some vague sense of like labor unions and the workers or whatever, you know, like, mm-hmm. and so I thought, sure, I'll do that thing. I don't know what that means. But over the course of that year, I basically started doing under this uh, classmate, her name's Alison Nowicki. I don't think she stayed in the field, but she's a lovely person. Anyway, she basically was um, encouraging me to just, you know, like if there are things that are wrong that you want to fix, you should fix them or work on fixing them. And so one of the things that happened was that there were uh, there was a requirement, an, an implicit requirement that in your second summer, you know, the summer after your second year, you needed to stay in town and study for your qualifying exams, which you would take at the end of that summer. And then at the beginning of that next semester, you would go into teaching. That's kind of the, that was the pattern there. And I think it's still there. The thing that was frustrating was that, you know, we weren't paid very well to go. I mean, the stipends at that time, this late nineties were $10,000 a year, just mm-hmm. low. Um, even then it was low. And we were also <laughs> receiving, but we did, excuse me, receive benefits, healthcare. Um, there were other things that we got. And so it was, and that was already the product of an earlier phase of this labor struggle on campus that I didn't, <laughs> that I was starting to learn about. Before then, I think the year I got there was the first year of this, where everyone had ten thousand dollars and ten thousand five hundred, I think it was, and healthcare. Prior to that, it was students. I think the stipend was a quarter of the students got eight thousand dollars, and with that tuition, I also had tuition covered. Um, a quarter got four thousand and tuition covered. A quarter just got tuition covered, and a quarter had to pay for everything, and that's a lot of money. Even then, it was a lot. You know, mm-hmm. at that time, it would have been twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year. Now it's what, like 50 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so over 50. And so um, it was a lot. No, no, I mean, wait, it must be much more than that. Anyway, uh, sorry. I'm I'm at a public university. We don't pay that. The students don't pay that much. Um, They still do pay, but not and too much. Anyway, um, (laughs) so um, that, that experience then, you know, didn't cover enough for the summer. So a lot of people have to take summer jobs. And I said, if you're expecting people to study for these exams, you should provide some funding for them. Yale is a very rich institution. You can find funding for, for them. And it turned out that there were funds available to do other things that we'd been receiving money for, including language study, which I took advantage of the, my first summer. And Gabrielle and I went to Germany and we were there for a summer and I learned German. That's how I know German. That's the mm-hmm. only really... Wow non-English language that I know which like well um, or pretty well, I would say anyway. And so that experience, uh, like knowing that that was there and knowing that these students were basically taking out loans to be there, I thought this is unfair. You know, it's one thing if it were, you know, a context without money, but Yale has a lot of money. Even then they had billions and billions of dollars in their endowments. I thought they can afford this. So we, we wrote a letter up, we signed it. The students had big meetings with the faculty and they did, the faculty actually did find, I think, $500 for students. And then that money ended up kind of going up over the over the time I was there. And there were other factors. But that made me realize that, oh, collective action can change things for the better. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge lesson. And that's really what I sort of came to realize, oh, there's something important about this, which is mm-hmm. you're not just doing this yourself. You're doing it with others. And that collective thinking, which, you know, I think I've always been a very social person, so I was inclined to it, but I didn't think of social, being social as a political thing. And then yeah. saw, oh, being social is a political thing when we act in concert. And so then through that, I decided I'm going to become a union organizer. And then through that, I met all these students in other fields. And then through that, I started sitting in on these reading groups on philosophy. And and then I encountered Michael Denning, who is still a mentor and one of my heroes and teacher. He was, uh, I taught a lot, of, took a lot of classes with him. He also was on my dissertation committee. And he um, he was teaching this, these reading groups or leading reading groups on Marx and Capital and the Grunrisse, which is the kind of draft for Capital. And uh, and those, those were just transformative. I, I thought, wow, this stuff is, hard. It's really interesting. I feel like it's giving me a purchase on the world that I'd not had before. And that really is what it was the combination of the reading and the thinking and being active in a political movement, which that was what changed it. And the, you know, the organizers were extraordinary. I mean, they were just so committed. They were, there were people who, you know, were taking a lot of time out of their day to go and meet other people, have these coffee meetings and try to like 
make the case for why a union matters and to really listen to what people's fears and concerns were and to be a good listener. And, you know, they didn't always get it right, but I think no one ever does, but they, I, on balance, they did an incredible thing. And actually just uh, within the last couple of days, the, the union after 30 something years of struggling was finally recognized earlier this year, they won um, a, an election and then they, just finished negotiating their contract like in the last day or two and it's a huge set of raises and benefits for for grad employees so it was it was a privilege to be part of that effort and it changed the way i thought about so many things and i would say that third kind of development really yeah set the stage for so much of my academic writing Mm -hmm. what 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 i think of the socialist movement in the united states i i feel like it's it's so often tied to the the music that was coming out to um, to celebrate the movement, celebrate the union. Uh, I, you know, Woody Guthrie I, I, it seems like a, a great example. Did you feel that the development for you in becoming a folk musician was also very much tied into? Um, forgive the expression if this is offensive, but the radicalization that you were um, you were developing a burgeoning kind of political consciousness. Um, do you feel like those were very tied together because they also seem also both of these seem kind of tied to your encounter with Louisiana. Yeah, they are. You're, I think they were, I mean, it, it, it didn't, it didn't work like that in the sense that my political awareness didn't then result in me thinking I'm going to write and participate in this tradition in a direct way. Mm-hmm. Well, in fact, I remember, cause I'd also, you know, over the years of being, oops, sorry, the years of being in Texas and, um, and then initially at Yale, I had stopped kind of doing a lot of the vernacular pop rock stuff that, you know, we were doing, you know, in high school <laughs> and, and no I started getting back to it. <laughs> no more true. Right. Which was, you know, that was totally like a satire. I mean, we were kind of imitating the police. I was doing this yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Voice, staying himself satirizing appropriating these jamaican voices i mean it's like so and so the whole thing was a joke right we were kind of yeah. satirizing a lot of these groups and in fact a lot of those tapes are us making fun of other groups whether it's like u2 or morrissey or whatever right and, yeah <laughs> and so i remember um, you telling me at the time like why are we doing a sting song when you hate sting so much it's like i i don't know I, I hate sting and yet we're doing a sting song <laughs> right and you know i i i liked it at the time you know i had yeah. mixed feelings about it um, we, we took I, it to a radio station we liked it so right. much <laughs> yeah, right, that's right um and you know i, I you know over the years i've, I've Got, had my ups and downs with Sting, about you know, um, and and many other things, right? But like I also in a strong um, yoga practitioner. <laughs> yes, he is. That's right. Wow. Um, but anyway, and so we ended up kind of um, meeting Sting at a party was surreal because <laughs> looking right at him, and like oh, remembering wow. remembering Tree Monkey, and I oh, also felt like he funny. looked at me with contempt at the same. <laughs> he was like, uh, hmm. You know. I don't trust you. Wow. Anyway. I mean, you know, yeah. Mm. I, I often have this debate with our mastering engineer about. I mean, it's it's this running joke now about like who who's worse, Sting or U two, <laughs> or Sting or Bono. And his take, he's a very funny guy. I was just emailing earlier today. He says, "Well, Bono's political crimes may be worse." <laughs> But, Sting, but Sting's musical crimes are probably far worse. And so, <laughs> which I, I think he's probably right about that. <laughs> it's very funny. Anyway, so um, so this was, you know, this was the kind of stuff I was, you know, that was in the background when I thought, well, I'll try to make political songs. And really, by that point, I was so influenced by like a lot of funk music. I loved in that kind of when I was returning to vernacular music, it was through black music and it was particularly through like funk and soul. And I loved, I still love Curtis Mayfield was a huge presence for me. And so I was writing these kind of Curtis Mayfield, Al Green style stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't really sing like that. And so that was also always a problem. I felt like I love this music, but I can't really sing like this or this, my voice isn't doing what I want it to do in that way. And so I always felt this tension 
Um, I remember even having like one like kind of rehearsal where uh, some friends came over, or at least one friend came over. We just started working on a song on some of these Mayfield in influenced things. And, you know, I, this Fred, like I remember later, much later, as you mentioned, he's like, yeah, I like that song you did or whatever. Um, but I not, nothing came of it. And so what happened was that in 2003, um, Gabrielle's classmate in art history, who's an art history historian now named Rob Slifkin, uh, came over. He and his wife uh, came over to our place for dinner, and he asked, um, "Would you, uh, would you like to join my country band?" And I thought it was kind of like the union thing. I thought, "Sure, I'll join your country band." I had no <laughs> idea what that meant, you know. Again, except that I hated country music in my mind or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Although I had, I had been primed by the O Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack, which I think, right that was that was yeah it was transformative for lots of people, right? I mean, yeah. people who were into country and bluegrass and old time prior to that resent, you know, like the late yeah. comers or whatever. And I was one, <laughs> and I definitely was. Yeah. And, um, but you know, it's, it's great musicians doing great music. And I thought this yeah. is wonderful stuff. And I, it sort of reopened me to that, the possibility. And then when Rob came uh, along, I thought, yeah, I'll try it. And he made these incredible mixtapes for us. And Rob was also part of like our whole group of like Marxists doing the Marxist reading. So like he was very much part of the circle that we were in, you know? Yeah. And, um, and so when he gave me these mixtapes and, you know, they had Merle Haggard and the Flatlanders and Terry Allen and all these people. And I thought, and Michael Hurley was such a big influence for, for me. I mean, this, I thought this stuff is incredible. Like, what was I missing? Like, I just didn't know how good this music was. Right. And then I started writing country songs and I started singing them. And in singing and writing them, I felt for the first time, I am writing music that feels like I feel really good about doing this. Like it, like mm. it's not a joke or satire only. I mean, there were joke satire elements, but it was also something else. And there was something real about that moment. There was something that it sort of fused with all of the anxiety and weird feelings I had about growing up in Louisiana and Slidell and, you know, what it meant to be from the South, but in the North. And then also being, you know, South Asian, which was like, you know, and the like racial politics of all this, like it all sort of came together in this very surprising way, writing these songs. And uh, I still remember that first song I wrote. It was called On the Same Train. Um, and it was, a you know, I played it on my piano, that grand piano my parents still have. And I yeah. recorded it. And I remember, and I, I still think that's a decent song. And I remember thinking, showing it to Rob. And he was surprised. He thought, wow, this is a good song. Like, you you want to do this thing. And then we started writing songs. I, I just, I kind of unleashed this torrent of songs. And some of those songs are still at least some waves of those things were things that we used to do in the band a lot, not, not as much anymore, but, um, but yeah, I, that was a huge moment. And then of course, all of the politics and the thinking came into the writing, what we were writing about. I mean, the first songs I was writing, the one that we used to do a lot was spy camera. And of course it was about the NSA and about, yeah. you know, all of the <laughs> sort of like surveillance state things. There was one called, uh, Stephen Thomas Erlewine, which was one that was written about the all music guide editor and writer, Tom Erlewine. He lives in Austin, Texas. He actually doesn't know that I've written this song about him, but he's heard the song and he's creeped out by it later. And I think that's really funny. Um, um, <laughs> it was actually kind of a tribute to him, but the basic story is that someone's kind of like, you know, plugged into the machine being forced to write reviews of every, all the music, you know? Like, and, and so it's this sort of like, you know, again, sort of satire slash, you know, uh, morality it's, tale. <laughs> that's such a beautiful way of describing that that moment when you became when you became you know uh, when you when you wrote that music. It became it was so, you were so in the way you describe it. What I'm hearing is a passionate investment. Yes. And, I, and I, the question I want to ask you about this topic because it's something that's like it's just um, it's exploding through our yoga community right now is like what separates someone who is an authentic practitioner from an appropriator. And so often it's dictated by uh, your cultural experience and which is to say your skin color. Yep. And so what I'm, what I'm so excited about is like, when is this moment and, and is it, is it, is it possible? Is actual learning possible? Is the question, and that really, you know, does it? When does something that you pick up that's foreign to you become learned? 
I mean, the, real. I, I think it's legit. Uh, you know, so this gets to kind of basically the my position on this is not the typical position, which is that appropriation is part of what humans do, right? We mimic <laughs> and copy each other all the time, and we when we're faced with doing so in a cross of cultural boundaries that seem significant, we still do it, right? right. And there now, now of course, those things reflect power relations and dynamics, and they will do that, and so. You can't separate that out from the process and sensitivity to that is what's motivating the kind of new sort of, you know, questions around authenticity and identity that have been around for a long time, frankly, but but are, are reanimated in our current moment. And um, yeah, I guess my feeling about it is that there are I'm loath to want to shut it to try to police and shut it down. You know, like that that seems like maybe the less helpful impulse. I think what's more helpful is maybe to learn, like to encourage people to, to think critically about it. That I recommend. And, you know, there are definitely, you know, experiences in my life where, you know, white Minnesotans would just come up to me and start asking me questions about my chakras and like this. And it's like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, like, and, and you know, I mean, you know, things that one could say are like, you know, racist in the, you know, like, you know, philic not phobic way right yeah. um like they're you know which i also think is different right I like love philia your is better right i love your people right yeah. yeah your hair is so beautiful i want to touch it or whatever you know like this kind of stuff yeah and you know sure like it, yes there's racism and it's totally true um but you know i and I and I also don't I would feel loath to like exploit and manipulate that kind of naive sentiment or whatever. But I but at the same time what I would say is you know my desire to engage with and try to kind of like encourage someone to think more critically about their experience and knowledge is really relationship dependent. I mean, do I have does the person have the trust with me to be able to listen to what I'd have to say about, you know, how you think about these things? And if I don't, I'm just going to be generous and nice and let people like work through whatever they want to work through and impose on me, whatever they want to impose on me and go on my way. But, you know, and one of the things I've really liked talking with you about when we've done it, not often enough, frankly, but is that you've developed, you know, Russ in particular, I mean, you've developed that kind of critical sort of sense of what this is that I'm doing, right? I mean, thinking about like the class politics of of the Iyengars versus Ashtanga and like these, you know, there's a lot and like the way, like there's just a lot of shit to unpack in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you think of it as just mystical fantasy, Indian spirituality that's transcendent and makes your life meaningful and moves you to better places, you know, you can have that. I don't want to rain on your parade, but if you want to do, if you want to do better and you want to think better about it, there are lots of things to learn and people have thought a lot about these things. And you should, you know, like I, you know, so to think of it as a teacher, like a union organizer to encourage critical awareness. I mean, we should do that with everything, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not unique to appropriation. That's just being a better community member in the world means like being sensitive to how things emerge and listening to people who are doing it and listening to people's contradictory feelings and experiences. But, you know, I, like, like I said, also policing these boundaries and having this kind of possessive investment in my culture, you know, I don't feel like I'm in a place to do that with South Asian culture. Like I was just saying, like my, my relationship to it is, is partial and fragmented and it would be weird. Yes. Do I find it weird when South Asian, non-South Asians, you know, participate in some of these cultural practices or mispronounce words or whatever it is? Sure. But like my feeling about it is, I also mispronounce German or French and I, you know, like I, so I'm, I just want to approach this with a kind of charity and generosity that seems like a better way through this. Yeah. And, and at the same time, try, if you're trying to kind of make some sort of political intervention about with around this, you should be really specific and concrete about what the task is, what you're trying to do. And one of the things that I find really frustrating in our identitarian moment is when people exploit this for personal like it's a career advancement move, you know, like I'm using my identity to kind of actually, you know, compete in the field and push people out of my way. And I've seen that happen. And that's, you know, I find that, well, it's not my way, you know, I mean, I'm not going to stop people from doing that either, but, <laughs> but, um, but it, it's not the way I approach things. So I, I, I love that you mentioned French because I had it right in my mind when you said it, <laughs> I was thinking of uh, Noah Chomsky, Noam Chomsky's, um, thoughts on on language 
uh, say the French Academy, uh, mm. is it, the effort to police how French is spoken. And yet you have areas of, of France that are very close to German. You have areas of Fr French that are very close um, to Italian and they speak French in a different way. And so, oh, yeah. and what actually is the boundary of France at that point, except of fiction? And I, it, I was, I'm, I'm using that as a kind of context to think about the the way in which I I act in the world, which is as a a, a, a term that I I discovered that I liked and then appropriated for myself was <laughs> code switching. And, oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> and so I often find myself, and it's kind of our listeners will probably recognize that I'm not doing that with with you. I'm not code switching into my New Orleans accent with you. Oh, interesting. I very often sink into uh, that accent when I'm talking to someone who I think is in any way related to the South. But he also mm. doesn't have a, a New Orleans no, accent. No, he doesn't. So he's not bringing it out. In yeah, I'm not no. bringing it out in you. Yeah. Which I think did, also yeah. kind of goes to your point that humans are constantly like, we're constantly reflecting who we're surrounded by. And so, you know, yes. if, if as Westerners, we go to India and spend a lot of time there, it's totally natural and normal that we're going to use our tongues differently. Yeah. Say yeah. things differently or look yes. at things differently or express ourselves differently yeah. or feel things. And, you know, as a Indian um, person, you know, generationally growing up in, in North America, I mean, it makes total sense that you feel so connected to American culture and music because it was so much a part of your experience and so yeah. i think as the world becomes more and more global we're there's so many more opportunities like we're not just living in a little village and not going further than we can walk right we're right. we have the internet <laughs> like we yeah, can I mean, learn from teachers this right now right? Yeah, <laughs> we can learn from teachers in china yeah. russia friends we can you know connect in all kinds of different ways and i will inevitably try to sound like the person <laughs> and, and so uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's just so interesting that i think there's there's this this expansiveness that's happening to us culturally uh -huh. and people feel very threatened by it often and that is also the movement towards this fascism, towards this um, kind of, this is mine and I don't want it taken away or I hold it dear yeah. and, and it needs to be kept unchanging because the change is happening so fast and the exposure is happening at like exponential rates. And so there's kind of a, a pushback in, in expressionism in that this is mine, not yours. And I don't want you to have it. That kind of like, and I don't want you yeah. to change it either. And I don't want you to change yeah. it and you having, it's going to change it. Right. So there's like right. this whole tension, I and, think that happens universally and it happens to, you know, to everyone, I think yeah. in some, in subtle ways or, or not so subtle ways. It's, I mean, it is interesting. I mean, from a Marxist point of view, I don't know what the answer is, but maybe you do. <laughs> well, the Marxist would ask the, uh, the the political economy of these things, right? Like, who's yeah. like, where does the money flow? Where does the like, how does how does the system kind of reproduce itself based on these sorts of exchanges? And again, like, that's where you know a lot of these questions are are often not raised in a I would say in only a nativist fashion, like typically these questions are raised on the left, right? Like the question of appropriation is a leftist question. It's the right that's saying, you know, at least in the U S I mean, I'm not aware of everywhere, but the right, it's the U S that people are saying things like, well, you know, um, the left, the holier than thou leftists are policing my ability to enjoy rap music or whatever. Right. Like that sort of thing, like as a white right wing person might say. And so, um, so, you know, th that's that. And so my, my thought again, is that, you know, if this is a conversation that the left is happening, having, I just want the conversation to be nuanced, you know, and, mm -hmm. and self-aware and self-critical. Um, and generally conducted within the spirit of what I hope the left should be, which is 
is generous and tolerant, right? And I mean, you know, yes, you can be intolerant of intolerance or what have you, but <laughs> but you have to, you actually have to, and the left actually does tolerate certain forms of intolerance. That's part of the story too. And so, so I, I, I don't know. And there is a sense in which some of these forms of intolerance then, and I think maybe getting back to what you were kind of alluding to that, like flip over and become like related to or resonant with, you know, authoritarianism. And it's true that the left is also, you know, people on the left are also skeptical or critical of democracy and, you know, and, uh, and, you know, the sort of liberal capitalist state. I have my own critiques of it, but I also am, you know, worried about unless you have something enough political power and enough of a kind of program to imagine what would be better that would replace it you know you have to you're asking for a lot of trouble and i and i and i and, and We've what seen you that. might yeah what you get might be worse than the thing that you that yeah. that you you started with right and so you know marxism maybe one of the important lessons of marxism is it's, it's a it's a history of failures right i mean it's a history yeah. of attempts to try to remake the world in a better place often by force and for both reasons of the power of the established, you know, sort of system and, you know, sort of classes, you know, social forces that militate against it, plus its own self-imposed mistakes. And, you know, to the point of like violences and, and purgings and, you know, murder, I mean, you know, the left has done bad things. And, I, you know, you and one has to kind of acknowledge that, I think, in order to figure out. How do you do it better? And you know, plenty of leftists. Uh, I'm not m inventing any of this, right? But, but mm -hmm. I do think, I do think that that question, like, if it's a question of people who are not necessarily instinctively or you know politically allied to the far right, where I think the conversation, you know, has parallels but is different, um, right. then I think it's it's then I think one has to kind of figure out how to advocate for the values on the left that you know, to push the left to live up to the best of itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It uh, also something that you were saying was reminding me about the, and, and I, I'm curious about, because in yoga, I know in India, you know, it's been used as kind of a political tool in a lot of ways, like for independence, mm -hmm. and even now, right, it's to Hindu prop fun. up Hindutva. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, if music's also ever been used that way in oh, India, totally. No, like, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, just universally. Um, I mean, yes, definitely. I mean, I, you know, I'm not an expert in like sort of the music of the right, but there definitely have, you know, been many figures and composers engaged with, you know, the, the politics of of the far right. I mean, many people talk about Puccini's sort of flirtations with and relationship ambiguous relationship with fascism. I or mean, fascism. Richard Strauss had this complicated, problematic yeah. relationship to the Nazis. There were composers who were much more like pro-Nazi composers of the, you know, say like Fitzner mm -hmm. or what have you. You know, who are composers who wrote interesting or compelling music, right? But so there's that in the classical music lineage. Yes, I mean, on average, I would say musicians who tend to be poor and tend to be, you know, kind of like many artists, not uh, occupying elite strata, at least initially in their upbringing, tend to be sympathetic to, you know, the sort of ordinary person yeah. or the, you know, working people, at least in the sort of history of capitalism. And it's, and even prior, right, the patronage but practices were often the wealthy who were like hiring poor artists to make something to celebrate, you know, the wealth of the aristocracy or the yeah. church or what have you. And I'm, so- the sympathy towards uh, patronage is, is exactly, yeah. Yes, yes. That's important the, to a poor person. <laughs> it is, it is, right? I mean, you yeah. have, you know, you, you have a complicated relationship to money and you're, this thing is helping you survive. But it's also been the case that in those contexts, people will paint in or work in references that actually are critical of even their patrons or elites or what have you. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting... I mean, this is an interesting moment, but Michael Denning used to teach in one of his lectures, the the architecture at Yale. And, the, you know, this is, you know, an elite institution run by, you know, sort of New England wasp elites, right? That's the sort of history yeah. of the thing. It goes back to very old college. And in the sort of neo-Gothic, Gothic revival sort of architecture and like all these sort of friezes and sculptures that are adorn many of the buildings, there are because these things, many of them were done in the twenties and thirties, especially 
many of there are like socialist references and like all like peppered in almost hidden right. in because you know these are workers who are class conscious sort of like expressing mm. in their own subtle way a kind of resistance to the sort of power structure of the very institution that's employing mm. them yeah. and and to go into you know sort of um the indian context which i know less about but one of the things that my mom has been teaching me as part of she's having more trouble with it now but like in the last couple of years she's been teaching me these marathi songs and they were mm. like popular songs of the 50s somewhere in marathi films somewhere in yeah. um you know just played on the radio or whatever and so she would sing them and i would learn the harmonium part and then i sing them with her she teaches me the words and we sing them together and it's been really interesting some of these figures i mean they the, some of these songs are really beautiful um but some of these figures like Sudhir Bhadke was one one of them. I mean, these people were very attached to then the version of the Hindu far right that was like the seed of what we have today. Mm -hmm. um, my mother, they're all of my mother's castes, which are Konkanastha Brahmins. Um, this caste was the same caste that includes uh, Veer Savarkar, who was founder of the, like a key founder of the Hindu nationalist movement. Mm -hmm. His follower, Naturam Gordse, assassinated Gandhi. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the like Indian and Maharashtrian sort of Hindu right has like this lineage that kind of is not far from my family. I mean, my mom, I think, is related by marriage to Veer Savarkar. So that's what oh she tells you, you know, like the, the degrees of separation are not long. And so, so just, and, and these musicians were also caught up in that. They were part of that. And they wrote beautiful songs that have implications that sometimes are weird, you know, and the more you know about it, I was talking with, um, uh, um, another ethnomusicologist, an ethnomusicologist who is also the same, like, you know, cast background as me at a conference in Austria that I was giving a talk at. Um, Beth and I were both speaking there and, um, and she's great. Her name is uh, Rasika Ajotikar, I think. And um, she was described, she said, oh yeah, all those people are all like, you know, full of this Hindu right stuff, you know? Right. And so, yeah. you know, so it's, an int and my parent, I think my mom, I don't know what my dad thinks, but he's not as part of that because he's, a different subcast of of Maharashtrian Brahmins who were grew up in the south of India mm -hmm. actually were people who moved there because of uh, Shivaji's conquering of the south and Tanaji was down there mm -hmm. and so they they kind of moved there with them to do administrative work and mm -hmm. so so that that's like his lineage they're called uh uh Tanjavari Tanj, Tanjore Maharashtrians mm -hmm. and it, then there are not these near, uh, not near Kerala at all, not not that far south. Not there, no. More Mad Madras, Chennai. Would was, be I was, oh, on the east. Yeah. So I, I was just east, thinking yeah. about the about you know India is as far right nationalist and theocratic as it is still has a communist state within it. Yes, Kerala, it's just yeah. and, and Bengal is also Beng yeah, is pretty Bengal as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It is extraordinary, and it just shows I think that the hand of the state in India is not that powerful. I mean, they can't, they can't centralize the country in a way that no. you might do in a small, more culturally homogenous mm -hmm. um, and maybe more developed and wealthier state or something. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, uh, you still have, you know, actually existing communism, you know, whatever in mm -hmm. Kerala and a very good friend of, of mine, who's a, an ec ecological justice activist and labor activist. He's a uh, Malayali and he goes that he's been down there a few times and spent time trying to think about, you know, all of the things one can learn from that um, that world, which is amazing. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. And that's, I think, a part of the the story of thinking about this kind of phenomenon is, I don't know, it's it's multi layered complexity, you know, like it's contradictoriness. And that's when I'm singing or working on or thinking about these songs with my mom. That's that's yeah. the spirit in which I want to kind of engage with it. And again, yeah. it also feels like an appropriation. I don't feel, I mean, yeah, I have the phonemes of Marathi in my head because I grew up with it. My mom's speaking it. Right. But this is very foreign. The music is, I mean, I grew up again, listening to Indian classical music, like elements of it are there in my head, but also not. And when I hear my mom sing, she does these ornaments and little variations that as not a strong singer as she may be, they're kind of, they're in her, you know, in a way, yeah. and they were in my grandmother in a way that they will never be in me, you know, and that people from the outside have to learn them, you know. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a paragraph here in, in the question list. I know we should have to, to wrap up soon. I just want to <laughs> get back to the music. Um, the On your new album, The Honor and the Glory of the Gated Community, there's a, there's a song. I'll just play it for a bit just to give us a little marker. It's um, To the Sea Once More. 
I was really taken with this song. Um, there's there's something just so interesting that are happening in the intonations uh, between you and Beth. You see, you both seem to have a kind of uh, extraordinary authentic authentic grasp of the intonations. And I was thinking okay. about it and I wrote down, I was thinking about it like there's a kind of command there in the way that you would have in Sanskrit have a command over the placement of the tongue in terms of, of uh, different D sounds or different the sounds. There's um, there's a Sanskrit word for those letters that I don't remember. Mm. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to I want to play this song for our listeners for just a bit. It's um aspirated sounds. You could probably say it that way. Afford no cause that I could not say, but I'd hold this close to my dying day till I knew that I found my home. Oh. There's a, there's a, there's, so, there's a kind of nasalness to it that is maybe overlooked even in fucking Nashville, where they mm. don't have a grasp over authentic, <laughs> uh, over the authentic sound, but those. Those mm, I don't know how to how to describe that. Diphthongs, diphthongs. Yeah. It's so wonderful, and Beth really has a command over it too. And I was wondering, is is Beth from Minnesota, or is she also from no. the South? She's from Montana, and so there are three singers on the track. It's me yeah. first, and then Rosie is the one above me, and then Beth is the top one. Okay. So, um, and rosie is from minnesota she grew up imitating the dixie chicks that's how she and her sister <laughs> acquired these incredible country voices and then beth has been you know she's a classically trained singer and she had to kind of learn it over time and she's developed a really powerful one over the years and so again like country music is an artifact of a practice that is like a fiction it's created right a kind mm -hmm. of made up way of being and singing this yeah. nasal twang has roots and you know in Scots Irish singing practices and British or Isles Bavarian, and it's, or Bavarian yeah. yodeling. Well, well, the yodeling too. Yes, that's which is also actually via minstrel troops that were doing it to satirize Bavarian yodelers. Um, that's <laughs> the, that's how I think the Jimmy Rogers came across his yodel. Um, and then um, and then there are you know uh, African American singing practices. There are indigenous singing practices that all they all flow into this thing in kind of weird random ways. And so so for country music to. I mean, country music is something that is so fundamentally inauthentic. It's it's a concocted, made-up genre that was a marketing, <laughs> a racialized marketing genre invented in the 20s. Hillbilly was the kind of, you know, the designator. Um, you know, it's it's long been something that prides itself on this kind of authenticity and is, is, you know, significantly made up or invented at the same time. And so, so to me, like it, you know, there's something about it in addition to its whiteness, even though it is like a kind of white working class practice, which makes me, you know, gives me pause, I guess, in my own imitation of it, I will say. Um, it is still something that, you know, I, um, I'm participating in a kind of invention of tradition that isn't, you know, unique to me. Um, yeah. and, are, are you yeah. familiar with uh, the Saskatchewan country music artist, uh, Coulter Wall? Yeah, yes, I, yes. He, I'm not well, but I do. He's kind of well. yeah. come out on the scene with his extraordinarily gravelly mm. uh, country voice. His father is the prime minister of Saskatchewan. And I don't know if you've ever heard him talk. No. <laughs> But he is white as cupcakes and and is so <laughs> so <easily>. Canada. <laughs> okay, guys. So we're okay. we are um, gonna just talk about the administration of the funds in Saskatchewan. And then you've got <laughs> his son, which is who his son has totally constructed himself. Now he's awesome and I love him. I love yeah. his music, but it's a total fiction. It's a fiction, right? And so for me, I feel like from song to song semi-consciously i'm kind of veering between what voice do i want i'm not thinking that hard about it although when i want a country sound i'm often like working through certain syllables with my bandmates about how i want something done um and with that song is is such a strange song because the whole history of it is really bound up with a, a police murder of a person of color in the twin cities shortly be like months before george floyd's murder Wow. What happened was that, so this the story is that there was Kobe uh, Heisler Dimock was, a, or Dimock Heisler was a, a young, um, I can't remember, is mixed race maybe, uh, 
uh, man who was on the autism spectrum and he uh, was having a bad day and he was yelling at his grandparents where he was staying and someone heard the yelling outside. They called the cops. The cops came in. They said he had a weapon. People say he didn't and they shot him and they killed him. And so, um, and I was asked to play because a dear friend of mine, uh, Jadzia Assembla is close to the family, asked us to, to play in a memorial event uh, in the fall, uh, uh, yeah, September of 2019. And we of course agreed to do so. And I, and we were thinking about, I was thinking about what we would do in the, in the performance other than our own songs. And I thought that and I was inspired by the fact that Jadzia told me that Kobe loved sea shanties and oh. which, you know, I know relatively little about other than the my, cliches. My brother loves sea shanties. Oh. He, he plays them for us every fucking Christmas and I have to go oh. listen to it in a couple days. It's going to, oh, wow. we all have to sit there and listen to him fucking play those things. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, so, uh, one morning, like not long before uh, we were going to do this uh, performance, I had this tune and I was sort of thinking about sea shanties and thinking about Kobe and thinking about what we would do. And this tune was just circulating in my head. And I realized before I knew it, I was making up the song and I thought, oh, I'm writing a song right now. So then yeah. I started writing the words down. I made a demo of it. I had the parts. And then I, and then I taught it to Beth and Rosie. And we did like an acapella version without the claps at the memorial, you know, it was, it was moving. People liked it. Um, wow. They sent it to the family. And then when we were in the studio, um, we recorded it. Uh, Rosie had the idea to do the slow uh, claps and it really pulled it together. And then wow. our recording engineer had us overdub parts. So that's us doing it. It's like all unedited, basically. A, a couple of the claps are edited because they're for timing. We screwed them up. But the, the vocals are basically <laughs> unedited, but we're, they're superimposed. And so it sounds like this kind of old time choir or something because mm -hmm. of the superimposition of parts. But that was the kind of genesis of it. And so this to the sea once more is about like returning to the sea and also like returning home, which is about returning, like dying, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's about this kind of trying to imagine, you know, this journey towards home, towards some space for this kid, you know, uh, oh, wow. having gone through what he went through. Yeah. So that's the, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's an intense thing to think about how it all sort yeah. of unfolded and an intense way to start an album, but, um, and it, you know, resonated very much with, with everything that's happened since. Yeah. Wow. That's a wonderful um, it's a it's a wonderful thing that you said about realizing that you're writing a song, and it's so critical for an artist to realize that they're having that moment of inspiration. Because so often you could just like daydream it away and forget that it happened, but you're like, oh shit, I'm this is happening right now, <laughs> and you have to go and find, you know, note paper to write the 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 thing down. And then yes. maybe work with that idea later. Maybe there's a way to develop it. But if you don't, it's gone. And you have to remember <laughs> yes. to do it. That's so beautiful. Yes. Well, it's it's very related to the fact that one of the things that's happened over the last several years is I've started to dream songs and then remember mm -hmm. them. And so the first one that really stood out to me was Georgia on our second yeah. album. Um, and that so one, I, oh, thanks. And um, I, um, we were, I was having this bizarre dream where um, essentially I was in the house of someone who had died and I was wandering around the space and I see this corpse on an old bed and I walk over to the next room and I'm in a movie theater and the credits of the film are rolling and this song is being sung by Joan Baez and Leonard Cohen. And it's just the acoustic guitar, the bass part and those two voices. There's like maybe a verse and then it's all that, Oh, trick! Take a midnight train way down to Georgia, which is obviously coming oh. from uh, like uh, right, the Gladys Night. Night in the Pits, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's like Night all Georgia. mixed up, yeah. Or yeah. Willie Nelson's wow. "A Rainy Night in Georgia." Uh, yeah, right. Had had Leonard Cohen just died when that song was written, or was it before that, or after? I think before he died. Oh he yeah, it was before. Yeah, this yeah. Song, this uh, the album is. I was gonna play "Divorce Dress," but Georgia oh. is. Because it really like when you when you sent me this album and I really so grateful that you you did and you now you have a habit of sending them to me which is fantastic oh, but it, it was like I received it and I was like this is this is a 
this old friend from high school is now making the music that I like. <laughs> and it was like, this is, this is, it was like, it was revelatory and it was so felt and so lived. And it was so very different from the classical musician that I knew who is now this. And I, I'm, I'm just so taken with your career and the arc of your life. And, you know, maybe I had a hand in you divorcing Gabri- Gabrielle, you know, this- <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but what I need to plug this computer and give me two seconds. You to sure. Percent, one second. All right. <laughs> Is it, am I, are we charging? <laughs> yes, we're charging. Okay. We're charging. <laughs> we were Good. on one or 2%. And so, All right. Uh, so anyway, no, uh, go back to where it was. I think it was good. I, that, yeah. I was I making, was I, mean, I was making a, a joke. Obviously uh, I didn't have anything to do with it, but we both kind of married <laughs> kind of Englishy girls and then divorced them. Which is yeah. odd as well. Another triple yeah. helix. I when you were away, I I put on the the Christmas special because I I th- would probably oh, have yeah. to tie this up and it's Christmas yes. coming. Uh, <laughs> this song, "Won't You Believe Me," by the Gated Community, the Christmas special, or the album, "Won't You Believe Me," the song Christmas special. Um, I kind of want to end with that song. I I wondered if you could. Oh, there's so many. I know you probably want to talk about the new album. Um, the honor and the glory, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but um, oh gosh, there's there's a lot of songs on that album, like "Stuck in Louisiana," "Born mm. in the USA," "Born to Lose," the Christmas special. That's also just such a wonderful album that people can find oh, on Bandcamp if you go to the Gated <laughs> Community website. Um, I feel like we could do maybe three more episodes on all the different things. We haven't really talked about Bob Dylan. And actually, actually that's kind of what I wanted to kind of (laughs) just talk about Bob Dylan and your, and your work on him and his, and his intonation, which is amazing. I mean, I, I, I think you're amazing. And I just, I want, I really thank you for honoring us with your, with your esteemed, presence on the show and oh, i know your time is very valuable but but i'm, just I'm happy so to no, I'm, I'm touched to have you have me it's great to talk with you let's let's talk about christmas special quick is that the way we're yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that's that's okay. the song i was okay i was playing and i can i should turn this off so yes. we can actually talk yeah Okay, you gotta pause it. <laughs> yeah. So no, that's so. This is a song that goes back to kind of the earlier days of when I was writing songs uh, with Rob Slifkin in that band, The Things Themselves. You know, which also Gabrielle was in that band. She learned to play fiddle a bit, and so she would saw away in it. Which yeah, it was I I love that she was doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, um, we um, ended up. Uh, not finishing the song but we were i was thinking about a christmas song and i remember some of the lyrics that were come were suggestions of rob's and i had this sort of progression in my mind and the the christmas is a time for shopping obviously you know it's like you know it's a <laughs> it's a critical song about christmas it's sort of funny and it's also sad which a lot of you know like especially when you get to the um you know Christmas, the second verse is Christmas is a time for gladness. I look, I'm waking up, I'm looking out through my window at the madness to see mm. who's running the fastest. Mm. Um, um, I'm blowing out all the candles, which I think about like Hanukkah too, right? And yeah. so, cause once a year is more than I can handle. 
you've heard this old ramble before. And, um, and I, and I, you know, I had not written most of that when I was in the things themselves, that this was like a fragment that had emerged and, uh, the chorus, like, uh, um, and I think the, I've been a bad boy this year. I think that was Rob's suggestion. Um, anyway, we, um, so he gets credit on the song, like I, I in the comp, the writing credits, but, um, anyway, um, we had an idea. We didn't finish it. Um, Rob also actually wrote this really great song called Stoned Beneath the Mistletoe, which I loved. It was another like um, Christmas song. And I I always loved that one. And I don't know if he ever, I don't know if you ever had a recording of it because it was so good. But anyway, that's one I wanted to do. Um, and so anyway, I revisited the song when I was in a moment early on of wanting to write Christmas songs. And I finished it and developed it. And I think like the kind of funny elements started giving way to the darker elements and that blend became sort of characteristic of, I think a lot of where the gated community sort of lived. I think mm -hmm. we're, we're moving even to darker places. The most <laughs> For you. Albums pretty heavy, yeah. but, but, yeah. um, but you know, I think we're picking up maybe to kind of something different and, and we're now sort of building up material for our sixth album. And, um, wow. and I have to say like the, I love doing this song because it's, you know, it's a secular Chris Christmas song. I actually have a certain fondness for Christmas songs. I really <laughs> like a lot of them. And so um, I, so I wanted to write one. And when I finally got this, you know, got to be able to do it. Um, I was happy because we could do this seasonal holiday thing at the same time, you know, like, um, you know, have a kind of critical commentary on the on the period, which is, you know, also in the uh, tradition of Christmas songs. I mean, if we make it through December, that's a Merle Haggard one, and that's a dark one. You know, the, so, you know, there, so there was that kind of lineage I was thinking about. Um, once we started doing it, which we've been doing the song for a long time. This is the oldest song on that album, I think goes back to maybe 2006 or so. Mm -hmm. um, so quite a long way. Um, we had a lot of well, maybe that I don't know. At least, at least seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there. It's uh, now it's I could figure it out, but I haven't. But that um, we we had all of these different sorts of things we were doing to try to emphasize aspects of it. A friend of ours had like this, uh, who was the drummer, not friend of ours, the former drummer. He was a um, he had a toy machine gun sound that he would play <laughs> at, like, at the end of the chorus. We had these like, and then I think one of the things from those sort of novelty esque elements that stayed were the sleigh bells, and Beth mm -hmm. plays plays those, and like, and the song, and we still do it live. We just did it, you know. We tend to do it around this time of year. Yeah. Um, the sleigh bells are one of the things that just kind of, you know, in the spirit not only of the Christmas song but also of, you know. Phil Spector and Beach of the Beach Boys, who, you know, God only knows ends with the sleigh bells too, right? And so there are these <laughs> layers to kind of the way that those things mean. And I think another one is the the um the chorus has elements of Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb in it, I think. Mm -hmm. Um and so there, yeah, just every song mm -hmm. I write is always like a patchwork of things that I like and I'm aware yeah. of and not aware of. And they all kind of come together and to make a little world. I always tell this to my students that every song is a world, like to give it its due and to really live with and think about and get into the, the lyrics and the sounds, the melodies, the singing, the performances, the production. I mean, yeah. so much goes into every single song. It's worth, you know, which is why in a lot of my popular music oriented classes, I have them write their final papers on one song. Like I want you to write on a single song. Yeah. And really get into the details because there's so much there to talk about. So anyway, that gives you some picture of it, but it um it is a, is a favorite of mine. I know our recording engineer loves the kind of percussive groove that came out of the the electric guitarists, you know, sort of uh, tic tac y style, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, guitar playing. It's um yeah, it's a it's a good one. Well, thank you so much yeah. for letting us into your world. And <laughs> I, I think that's that's often what we think about this podcast, that it is that. It's like each each unique one is an entire universe. And there's a lot more here for us to dig into and talk to. And I hope we, we get the chance. Uh, I would love to. Thanks again for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. Wasn't it fun? 
I loved it. Oh my gosh, so good. If you didn't know, we have a open community, Finding Harmony community. It's hosted over on Mighty Networks, and I want to invite you to join. It is a place where we have discussions. You can also practice with me once a month, some pranayama, some breath work practices. We have challenges and meditation groups and conversations about the podcast. You can also make suggestions for guests that you would like us to interview, as well as just talk about what you're learning or what you're noticing, uh, not just in the podcast, but in your practice, in your life. It's a beautiful online community. And I'm curating it on Mighty Networks, and it's open for all of our listeners, so that's you. I hope that you come on over and join us. It's a great group of human beings, heart-centered humans that are all interested in spiritual practices, Ashtanga yoga, coaching, personal development, growth, meditation, breath work. We're really diving into how to deepen our spiritual practice beyond just the obvious and infuse our spiritual practice into everyday life, how we can find harmony within ourselves, within our lives, and bring it out into the world. So I would love for you to join my Finding Harmony community. Uh, You'll find the link in our show notes here and also in my bio on Instagram. I can't wait to welcome you in and get to know you more and have you be a part of this great group of human beings who are all finding harmony in different ways within themselves and within the world. That's it. We've concluded another episode of the Finding Harmony podcast. I just want to thank you so much for doing the work that changes the world, starting with yourself. It truly does make a huge difference. Please make sure you have your automatic downloads turned on wherever you listen so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. I have so much more magic I can't wait to share with you. Lastly, if you're on Instagram, I love connecting and hearing from you. So come on over and say hello at Finding Harmony Podcast. And you can also come say hello to me personally at Harmony Slater Official. Thank you again for being here. I cannot wait to share more with you in our next episode.